under materialism or under atheism, we're nothing more than kind of moist robots. And well, that, that's one way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> and then our, our consciousness basically is is the fizzing of chemicals. Um, now, under this, can we then trust our own thoughts? Under the atheistic world worldview, can we trust our own well, thoughts? Well, of course not. Of course not. Could, could you explain that's why? A, that's a fundamental problem. I was taught quantum physics by Sir John Polkinghorne, wow. and he makes uh, a lot of fuss about this, that if you reduce thought to neural events, the firing of neurons and synapses and so on in the brain, then you empty it of all meaning. Hmm. So this, as he puts it, this just cannot be true. And that kind of reductionism yeah. is doesn't look very impressive these days, reducing everything to physics and chemistry, because it proves too much. And even leading atheists begin to see the problem. Thomas Nagel is perhaps the most famous of them in New York, a brilliant uh, philosopher, and he has seen the difficulty, even though he remains an atheist. And he points out there's something wrong somewhere, because if we follow the kind of evolutionary naturalism route and uh, apply it to human thought, it renders it meaningless. It undermines its own position and therefore it collapses. Yeah. And he's trying to replace it with some other materialistic ideas, but he's not being successful. So I think the point is absolutely right. C.S. Lewis, as usual, made the point brilliantly many years ago when he says any argument that invalidates human thinking cannot itself be valid since it's reached by human thinking. And that puts it in a nutshell. Hmm. That goes out, you see, and it's at the opposite end of the explanatory spectrum. The biblical explanatory spectrum is not in the beginning there were fizzing particles, but in the beginning was the word. Absolutely. It's a word-based universe. Yeah. Mind is primary, mass energy is secondary, whereas the atheist viewpoint is the exact opposite of that. Hmm. And that's where the conflict comes. It's between these two worldviews. But one of them, the atheist one, makes no sense of science. It's mm. not that it's simply anti-God, that's clear. Yeah. But it makes no sense of science, and therefore I reject it wholeheartedly. Yeah, because science is based on rationality, logic, and um, working things out. Obviously, mathematically, you're a mathematics professor. Um, that would you, would you say that goes the same for morality as well? Objective morality or subjective morality if we are just moist robots and our consciousness oh, well, is fizzing exactly. in the brain? I, I, I think, as I hinted before, that if you don't bring God into the equation, you have great difficulty finding objective morality. Mm. And although many people reject objective morality, in practice they don't because they do believe, the vast majority of people, believe in certain absolute moral truths like torturing infants is wrong. Yeah. It would be a very diseased person who would reject that. And it was an atheist philosopher in Oxford, J.L. Mackey, who said if there's any absolute moral truths, then there's a very quick argument that brings you from there to the existence of God. And so I think that's right. And the two big arguments that Paul uses at the beginning of the book of Romans mm -hmm. are those, first of all, the what we see in the universe, uh, that we perceive that there is a God behind it. Yeah. And secondly, human moral discourse shows that people, whether they realize it or not, are conceding that they agree with a moral standard that's outside of all of them. And therefore, we have objective morality. So the two belong together. I think the arguments are very similar and very important.